I think for even the normal person, maybe in India, if they could restrict their carbohydrates to no more than 100 grams per day, and for those carbohydrates to be more than 20% fiber, simply doing that will cause a profound change in their metabolism and, and also produce profound metabolic benefits. Hey everybody, what's good? Welcome back to the Next Move podcast. And if this is your first time on the show, we're a podcast that shares the strategies, stories, and tools behind people who are making an impact in their field. And today I have Dr. Dominic D'Agostino with me, who is a neuroscientist that started studying the ketogenic diet because of its impact on stuff such as seizures and has now become the foremost expert on the planet on the ketogenic diet. So today we're really gonna get into the basics of the ketogenic diet and how you can apply it to your life and how you can make it sustainable for your life. And, and actually we're gonna check if it's, it's good for your life. Is it, is it a good fit for you? So I'm really excited for this because I wanna tell you a quick story before we get into it. When I moved from the US to India, I used to have prepackaged meals from health food company, companies in the US send me food for the week. And I wanted to do the same thing in India because it turned out my working hours were actually longer. And I, I signed up for this one company and they do a variety of things. They're kind of a full stack health company and they, they have gyms, they have online classes and they have health food delivery. And one of the things that came up was keto under the diets. And so I was looking into it. I, I know Tim Ferriss has used it. I know Joe Rogan has used it. And I know you've been on both their podcasts. And it was really funny because it was the, a quarter of the plate was chicken, a quarter of the plate was vegetables, and half of the plate was rice. So it, even me and novice knew that was completely wrong. So I just want to start with you. What is the ketogenic diet? Yeah, uh, it's a diet that is unique in that there's a biomarker that can indicate whether you have achieved a state of nutritional ketosis. So it's the only diet to my knowledge that actually has uh, a biomarker that defines the diet. And it's sort of a, a binary uh, biomarker. You're either in ketosis or not by definition of your blood ketone levels being 0.5 millimolar or higher. Uh, urinary ketones, 15 milligrams per deciliter or higher is usually the clinical cutoff. So essentially it is a macronutrient ratio that mimics the physiological state of fasting in that it suppresses the hormone insulin and that stimulates fat oxidation in the liver and accelerated oxidation of fatty acids in the liver, we call beta oxidation of fats, that contributes to the uh, accumulation of something called acetyl-CoA. And then that, an accumulation of acetyl-CoA will result in the production of ketones. And then the ketones spill into the bloodstream and provide energy for our peripheral tissues, including our brain and our heart. And that, that would be a description of ketosis, the ketogenic diet. You can achieve the state of ketosis by fasting, uh, or you can do it with a ketogenic diet. And more recently, you can achieve it with uh, exogenous ketone supplementation. And I have an interest and in research in each one of those sort of methods to achieve ketosis. Okay, so if I get this right, when you're on the diet, you're, you're mimicking the state of fasting, right? Your body is in that same state. Yeah, in 1921, uh, studies at Mayo Clinic, they observed that the state of fasting could control seizures and they wanted to know what was unique about fasting that controlled seizures. And the thing that stood out was that uh, from a uh, physiological point of view, the body was making these ketone, uh, ketone bodies, beta hydroxybutyrate and acetyl acetate were measured. Uh, and it was observed that if you decrease the amount of protein in the diet, it's not a high protein diet, it's actually a high fat diet. If you decrease the amount of protein and significantly restrict carbohydrates to very little, if any, uh, and have primarily fat, actually the first ketogenic diet was like 100% fat. So if, if, the, if the greater ma macronutrient ratio is fat, 
then you start producing these ketone bodies and you lower the hormone insulin, you lower glucose, and you uh, change the metabolic physiology of your body in a way that changes the neuropharmacology of your brain in a way that is neuroprotective and it, it has an anti-seizure effect. And the top, many of the top labs in the United States and even abroad are trying to still understand the mechanisms of the ketogenic diet. And it's something that we actually uh, spend a lot of time and effort in our lab into achieving that. But it's, it's defined by a macronutrient ratio. And I, I think that's a great leading question. What is the exact macronutrient ratio? I know, I know there's a the standard one that you were talking about, but there's also a modified version. So, so what do these look like? Yeah. Yeah, uh, the classical ketogenic diet is, uh, and they do it by ratios in grams, the food, the food by grams, but it's a four to one ratio ketogenic diet. It's classical, and that would be four parts fat to one part a combination of protein and carbohydrates together. And eating that ratio, so if you would have, you know, uh, Essentially, if you do the percentages, because fat has a higher caloric density than protein or carbohydrate, it has nine calories per gram. From a percentage point of view, it's about 87 to 88% fat. And the balance of that uh, percentage would be uh, typically protein and carbohydrates that are non-glycemic, typically fiber, um, fibrous carbohydrates like green vegetables and things like that. So that's a very hard protocol to follow from a dietary perspective. Over the years, uh, there have been modifications of the ketogenic diet to include, the most liberal one is the modified ketogenic diet developed by uh, Dr. Eric Kossoff at uh, Johns Hopkins with John Freeman, the late John Freeman. And that got publicity and uh, books were written about it in 2008. And that diet is used for adult epilepsy, whereas the, the classical ketogenic diet was used primarily for pediatric epilepsy. And that would be higher, it's about two, at least two times more protein, about 20 to even 30% protein in some cases, and 60 to 70% fat, and uh, you typically less than 5% carbohydrates. And then you have in between, you have an MCT-based ketogenic diet, which the, a greater percentage of fats are from medium chain triglycerides. And these are metabolized in the liver to produce more ketone bodies. And then you have a diet that's not really ketogenic, uh, typically not, is a low glycemic index diet, which at Harvard, uh, Elizabeth Thiel, uh, had published on this particular diet, and it's uh, it's it's carbohydrate restricted, but it uh, the the types of carbohydrates are restricted in that they cause a minimal impact on your glycemic uh, response. And the diet, interestingly, has a anti seizure effect, not as great as the ketogenic diet, but it does not produce a state of ketosis. So. What we can garner from that is that, you know, limiting glucose availability and restricting carbohydrates has a therapeutic effect, even independent of ketosis, but seems to be more profound protective effects if a state of ketosis is achieved. So that's really interesting. And um, I, I have a few follow up questions on protein and carbohydrate, which we'll get into, but I really want to know why is being in a state of ketosis or a state of fasting good for us? Like what physically is it doing to us and how is it replenishing our body by being in that state? So it depends. I study the ketogenic diet as a medical therapy. And okay. although the ketogenic diet has gone mainstream and in 2008, before there was a lot of buzz about the ketogenic diet, I wanted to understand personally what it was like to be on a ketogenic diet. So I followed uh, the first version of the diet was the classical ketogenic diet. And it was quite difficult to follow. Um, and then I converted over to the modified ketogenic diet, which is pretty much what I do now, actually. Um, so the ketogenic diet has uh, a number of clinical applications. Uh, it, it works remarkably well for seizures independent of the etiology. 
So you could have temporal lobe epilepsy, absence ep epilepsy. We study something called oxygen toxicity seizures, which is a limitation for Navy SEAL divers, and it works pretty remarkably well for that. Uh, we have human studies going, but in the lab, it works really well. Uh, and then it works for a wide variety of neurometabolic diseases. So diseases where energy metabolism is impaired in the brain. And that could be a result of uh, an impairment of glucose metabolism and glucose transporter deficiency or py pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency syndrome uh, and various uh, inborn errors of metabolism that are like that. In those cases, actually the ketone bodies provide an alternative energy substrate for the brain and it, it essentially just enhances brain energy metabolism. So, you know, this was apparent to me in 2008 or nine. So it inspired me to actually study Alzheimer's disease. And we looked at Alzheimer's mouse model uh, and, and did some interesting work there. And others, other people at the time started studying that and showing therapeutic benefits with the ketogenic diet. And, uh, and I was studying a variety of, of different cell types and started studying a cancer cell line and observed that when grown in the presence of ketones, the cancer cells did not divide as rapidly. So a, a few years after that, uh, one of my PhD students, actually my first PhD student at the time as an assistant professor, wanted to do a project on the ketogenic diet and cancer. And that was like 2009 or 10. And so we started doing research and publishing on this. And now we study the glucose lowering effect. We study uh, genetic diseases like Angelman syndrome and Kabuki syndrome. Uh, and we study uh, a wide variety of different applications of the ketogenic diet. Uh, I think type two diabetes is actually kind of like the low hanging fruit of the ketogenic diet. And, and now it's more when I got into studying this, it was not accepted, but now companies like Verta Health, uh, there's a company, I'm wearing a continuous glucose monitor here that monitors my glucose all the time and I can look at it on my cell phone uh, through the app. It, the company is called Levels Health and it uses a variety of different uh, hardware, biosensors. And this is, very useful information that can help you personalize your diet to optimize your glycemic variability, which is off the charts in a normal standard American diet uh, that's rich in sugar or processed carbohydrates. So the ketogenic diet has a remarkable effect at basically optimizing your metabolism by creating uh, by reducing gly glycemic variability to ensure that glucose is being used optimally in your cells and tissues. And I think that has tremendous implications for uh, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, which is a big problem in the U.S. and I think even a, a, a very big problem in India. It's a, it's a huge problem in India and I really want to get into the diabetes aspect. But I, before I do, do you use, um, I know you study the ketogenic diet for medical purposes, like you were saying, but you use the ketogenic diet, right? So why did you choose to use it? And are there general health benefits or are you using it for potential disease prevention in the future? I, I started using it. I, I had, a, I went through a nutrition program, I should say, okay. in college, in undergrad. And uh, my view of the ketogenic diet was not a very favorable view. Uh, I viewed it as a pretty extreme metabolic therapy to, to be used after all drugs have failed for epilepsy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I guess it was, and that was back in the mid 1990s. So it was more than 20 years later, uh, no, about 15 years later, you know, I started studying it for seizures and realized that the clinical application was for, for seizures. So I wanted to uh, first and foremost, understand the different types of diets. We were also developing ketone supplementation for military applications. So I wanted to compare the diet to, uh, personally compare the diet to ketone esters and, and ketone supplementation. And uh, 
And I also wanted to evaluate the various commercially uh, available technologies that allowed us to measure the ketone metabolites in the blood. And at the time, there was a, a number of different technologies, so I was, I was testing different devices to do that. Uh, and the more I started following the ketogenic diet, it was kind of rough in the beginning, but the more I started following it, the more my body adapted to using fat as an energy source. And I realized that my appetite was suppressed, uh, but I had stable energy throughout the day. And, uh, and logistically, it helped me a lot because at the time, prior to that, I was eating like five or six meals a day. I was very into weight training. And I just thought that I had to eat at every two to three hours to maintain my energy, my strength, my performance. But realize that once your body adapts to using fat and ketones for fuel, that I could, uh, after a transition period, maintain my energy and maintain my performance and my strength. So this was not something that I actually uh, would predict. And, uh, and then I started doing some studies abroad with colleagues. Uh, we published a study in 2012 on the ketogenic diet and elite uh, gymnasts and showed that for athletes that need to make a certain weight requirement, the ketogenic diet is remarkably well because it can make certain athletes reduce their body weight to, to make weight and also uh, I guess you would say increase their strength to weight ratio so they could gradually decrease their weight and maintain their strength performance and that's what we observed in the gymnasts. So I was experimenting with the ketogenic diet, ketone supplementation, and even fasting and doing a lot of measurements on myself and the more I did it the easier it got and the more benefits I derived from it primarily from a work performance perspective because I was entering a tenure track position and it allowed me to have more time to focus on my work and not have to prepare a meal, eat a meal, clean up. So I, I transitioned from, you know, six meals a day to like three and then two and then occasionally one. And that was actually working pretty well for me. Oh, yeah, I, I've tried one meal a day and I, I really do like it too because I find that if I have a meal in the middle of the day, I tend to really get sleepy right after that. So if I extend it out to the evening and have a bigger meal, I don't really have that dip. And I want to get into, like we talked about, the diabetes aspect. And in India, it's, it's insane. So I work in an office and I, just to give you a little example of how the carb intake is, is there's three meals a day. Breakfast is very carb rich. Lunch is a huge plate of rice and dinner is again, a huge plate of rice with some sort of vegetable. And throughout the day, it, people are having like six to seven cups of coffee with half of the cup being milk and another tablespoon of sugar at minimum throughout the day. So it's, it's an incredible amount of carbohydrate that's coming in. And I feel that as a mix with the, the fact that it's, we're so inactive as a nation is leading to our, our rising diabetes numbers. So I, I want to talk to you a little bit about what are your thoughts on, on carbohydrates? I know you, you don't eat that many, but what do you generally think about carbohydrates? Yeah, uh, well, I think everybody has a carb tolerance, right? And the only way to fully understand, you know, what our carb tolerance is, is to actually measure our glucose response to ingestion of carbohydrates in graded amounts or do a glucose tolerance test, something like that. Uh, you know, when, when I was younger, I had a very high carb tolerance. I grew up in an Italian family. We ate bread every day, pasta, uh, you know, once or twice a week and uh, didn't suffer any overt consequences to that and stayed relatively lean, I think. And and participated in, you know, was very active too on top of that. So I think that the carbohydrate overconsumption and inactivity sort of exacerbates one another, especially in urban environments too, where there's more availability to process carbohydrates and sugar. Uh, so I'm okay with carbohydrates uh, as long as they're titrated and adjusted to the individual. But you know, with that said, 
there are remarkable advantages to carbohydrate restriction because it allows you to shift your metabolism to fatty acids and ketones, which has metabolic benefits overall. And even at the level of the mitochondria, you are stimulating what's called mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation and shifting away from glycolysis to oxidizing a fuel source that actually produces less oxygen free radicals. Uh, but, you know, it, we have to view it in the context of total calories too. So if you're consuming carbohydrates, but you are at a calorie deficit or you're getting just enough carbohydrates to meet your caloric needs, you're not going to see significant or even any overt consequences to that. Uh, the problem is that when you eat carbohydrates, you tend to overconsume them in a way that causes metabolic dysfunction if you continue that in a protracted manner. And also as we age, we become more carbo carbohydrate intolerant. So we have to acknowledge that and adjust our source of carbohydrates, the total caloric consumption of carbohydrates and calories in general. And I think that's a big root of the problem. And some may argue that certain carbohydrates here in the US, high fructose corn syrup, or specific types of, of sugars will uh, produce insulin resistance and carbohydrate intolerance faster. Uh, and it's, it's a bit of a debate, but I think the, the primary reason is that people just simply overconsume the carbohydrates and are more likely to do it because if you eat carbohydrates, you have a spike in glucose, a release of insulin, and it causes a postprandial dip in your blood glucose that triggers hunger to eat more of that <laughs> carbohydrate source. So that's that's one of the big problems associated with it. Right, and yeah, I definitely feel that, you know, when I have carbohydrates, I, for some reason I can stuff myself, but then for some, there's always a little more room for extra food. Um, yeah. And it's interesting to know the reason behind that. So if there was someone that wanted to start right now, the, they wanted to get on the ketogenic diet because of the benefits. They may have diabetes, type one or type two, or, or several, for several different reasons. The transition is tough, right? There's a lot of changes in the diet, especially for an Indian whose, whose majority of their um, macronutrients come from a carbohydrate source. So what's, like, what's an easy way to dip your foot into the ketogenic diet or even a modified ketogenic diet to see if the benefits will you know, accrue to you? From a perspective, you know, uh, a cultural perspective, I think my understanding is that like in India, type 2 diabetes occurs like a decade earlier than many other nations, right? So I think it's really important for, uh, for our youth, the younger individuals, to restrict sugar and restrict processed carbohydrates. Uh, I mean, maybe gone are the days, and you would know better than me, where like your traditional meal was like a, a vegetable stir fry, fry or something like that, where uh, it wasn't processed sugar and processed carbohydrates. But, uh, but I think there's a genetic predisposition too, and that's combined with an environmental or lifestyle factors. That, and the combination of those two, having a genetic predisposition and then environmental factors, which primarily are lifestyle factors, but maybe even things in the environment itself, uh, triggers this insulin resistance that I think is, is ubiquitous, more so in the urban population, right, in, in India, where you have a sort of visceral adiposity, where you have a collection of, of fat in the, in the intraomental area, and that's a, that's a visual sign, that's an overt sign of insulin resistance over time. And, uh, and then the more insulin resistant you, you get, the more beta cell sort of lesions and destruction can occur over time. So you can like become insulin dependent kind of over time. Uh, so I think it, the important thing is maybe uh, for, for in people to acknowledge that it's because it's been a gradual transition that that's a problem, <laughs> that, that having that metabolic phenotype especially when it comes to trunk obesity and that intraomental uh, adiposity, that, that is a significant problem, especially if it's occurring in individuals that are younger in their 20s and 30s, 
uh, if they have it in their 20s, and, and many people in India do in urban areas, that's going to significantly reduce your, your lifespan and your health span over time. It's going to cut years off your life. So I think it, it would be important to actually go back to some of the traditional uh, foods and sources of those foods and acknowledge that uh, things like bread, processed bread, processed carbohydrates, and sugar need to be reduced and then replaced. If you, if you take something completely out, that typically doesn't work. <laughs> we know that with drugs, if you stop cold turkey, but if you replace a starch or processed carbohydrate with vegetables and or replaced uh, a candy bar with fruit, that's, that's a step in the right direction. So simply doing something like that. And, and I think another like easy thing to do is to look at the carbohydrate source. And at least in the United States, it tells you how much fiber. If you only consume carbohydrates that have 20% of that carbohydrate is fiber, 20% or more, just simply doing that will cause a significant uh, improvement in your glycemic response and also help to increase the uh, satiety of the meal over time. And replacing some of the carbohydrates with protein is also an important step you know, you could do. Got it. And um, I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on two things. One, a quick question. You were talking about the inter- Ordinal area. Sorry, I, I missed the word. Is that your stomach and your oblique region? Yeah, yeah, your uh, intraomental area. Intraomental. So, yeah, you have. Uh, it's essentially, it's your stomach, and you can still have a relatively small amount of subcutaneous fat. Okay. But the abdomen and the waistline expands, and uh, and that fat is surrounding the internal organs in a way. And that's the most visual overt manifestation of what we call metabolic syndrome, which is insulin resistance. Okay, yeah, because in India, like it's a very, it's a very kind way you put it, but if you walk down the street, it's, yeah. it's incredible the, the kind of, I, and I don't wanna be rude or anything, but the, it's, it's all centralized. All of the fat are centralized there for some reason. You know, they can have really skinny limbs, legs, and arms, but then everything goes there. So that also explains it a lot to me. And food in India is also, funnily enough, it's, it's getting a lot of, a lot westernized. So we're, we're having these malls and grocery stores open up with solely imported foods. So we're getting things like, I know you, you like to eat sardines a lot. We have, you know, peanut butters from all around the world. We have uh, all these different types of food that are coming in. So I'd love to know for someone, again, who's maybe now they've, they've dipped their toes in the water and they've, they've reduced their carbs or exchanged their carbs. Now, what does the next step look like? And what is, maybe what does your day look like? What, what do you eat in a typical day? Well, uh, getting to me, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how that could be translatable to, to folks in India. Uh, my typical day is, uh, I like, I function really well off two meals a day and now maybe three meals. If I'm today, I might skip the third meal just because I have a couple meetings and I won't have time to eat until dinner. So, uh, typically I like to get protein and fat in the morning, like no carbohydrates uh, at all. And today I had uh, not sardines, but I had mackerel that was packed in olive oil and a single can. So a relatively small amount uh, of a small can of mackerel. And then I had uh, a bar, it was a perfect keto bar. <laughs> That's the name of the company. And it was, uh, had basically a macronutrient ratio that would, you know, it's one of the few bars on the market that actually has a macronutrient ratio that's pretty in line with the ketogenic diet and it also has medium chain triglycerides. So I consume that bar and if I measured my glycemic response, it was it looked like I was fasting. <laughs> so fish, fatty fish uh, in extra virgin olive oil with a ketogenic bar was my first meal and I ate it about three or four hours after I woke up. So I woke up, did some work, got to the office and worked a little bit and then ate that. And then the next meal, 
and that was about two or three hours ago, the next meal will be in about six hours. So I have no hunger uh, and my next meal will be the larger meal. It'll be the dinner meal. And that will be uh, typically we have grass fed, grass finished beef here. And I know not everybody eats beef, uh, but it's usually chicken or beef and a large salad. Uh, we start the meal with a large salad and have some kind of vegetable that's sauteed in olive oil uh, with a, a fatty source of protein. And that could be chicken, uh, pork, or beef. And I've been eating more fish lately, so different types of fish. And so, so that makes a lot of sense to me. And there's, there's really no carbs there other than the vegetables. And I, I want to get into a few things because like you know, and you mentioned a lot of India is, is vegetarian or even vegan, yeah. but a, a large percentage is vegetarian and dairy is a huge aspect. You know, I was talking about milk earlier, but curd and yogurt is a huge part of our diet. Now, do you, do you consume any dairy? And if you do, um, why do you? And if you don't, why don't you? Yeah, I do. Uh, good question. So the the next meal that I would eat after dinner, so I do snack every night. And uh, sometimes I have Greek yogurt, uh, but typically what I have is uh, a quality sour cream with good cultures in it. So sour cream, and then I add blueberries or some type of berries to the cream, and that eliminates the sugar spike. So I have a uh, sour cream, I add some cinnamon and cocoa powder, non-sugar cocoa powder, berries, and stevia sweetener, a little bit of that. And it's actually very good <laughs> in that the, the sweetness uh, with the sour cream, with the berries mixed together, has minimal effect and uh, it satisfies my sweet tooth, I guess you could say. Uh, so for, for me, if I eat a lot of dairy protein, it doesn't agree with me much, at least the protein we have here. But if I eat fermented dairy that's been uh, fermented like sour cream um, or a, a yogurt that has uh, a certain blend of cultures in it where the, the sugar is digested, uh, I'll eat that occasionally. But I have sour cream every day. So that's the primary source of yogurt. And sometimes I'll go you know, a very long time and won't have any dairy protein, but always have dairy fat incorporated into the diet. So th that's a great way then for Indians, right, to incorporate a high fat. And it is, uh, dairy is a medium protein source of, of nutrient, right? Uh, dairy is a good source of protein for those that can tolerate it well. And okay. uh, if you don't, if you want to add more fat to your yogurt, or curd, you can add sour cream to that curd to increase okay. the percentage of fat to hit the ketogenic macronutrient ratios, right? And then you can have that with a source of protein. You can, uh, that becomes sort of the, a good base of calories. Because I know a lot of people in India will make their own yogurt, right? Yes. I mean, yes. Uh, I, have, I had many friends uh, through grad school and my, my fellowship that were from India and they would always bring me yogurt and traditional foods and things like that. And they were always making their own yogurt and bringing that in. And it was always very good. It was better than what I could get at the store. Yeah. Right. And, and that's one of the great things about India and kind of one of the things that we have down in terms of the diet perspective, because in India, food is a very big thing and even the preparation is very big. So, you know, everything we eat in, in traditional families is kind of made from scratch. It's made from raw food. And then, you know, uh, you know, put into a final meal, which is one thing that we do really well. And this is just a question that I have that I, I like, I want to ask you because I don't see it in, in many diets, like the slow carb diet from Tim Ferriss and, and yourself. I haven't heard you talk about it, but is peanut butter a, a good way to get into ketosis? Is it a good food to incorporate? Yeah, I think peanut butter is great, you know. Um, okay. I don't, I, I use a variety of different nut butters. I have cashew and almond and uh, occasionally I have walnuts. If I eat a lot of peanuts uh, or nut butters, it tends to irritate my GI system a little bit. So I kind of moderate it to no more than like two 
spoonfuls a day, but I think peanut butter is great, especially the kind that's natural without the added sugar. Uh, it's a great source of, uh, now legumes on the other hand, if you eat a lot of legumes, some may argue it has anti-nutrient qualities. Like, um, you know, so I know in traditional Indian culture is to have uh, legumes and, and beans lentils. and I think, but yeah, and lentils, but I believe that they're soaked and prepared in a way that decreases the, the phytates and the things that can sort of bind and have anti-nutrient qualities. And, you know, with that, I'm, I'm very interested in, in the fact that, um, you know, what does, what does a cheat day look like? Let's say you're, you've got your diet down, you're, you're at a level where you're, you're feeling good and the diet for 90% of the time, it's, 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 you're doing good. What does a cheat day for you look like? Yeah, you know, I, the foods that I eat are the foods that I enjoy. So I don't really cheat that much um, per se, but I will, there are very savvy entrepreneurs that have brought foods to the market, the ketogenic market that are now uh, legitimate ketogenic foods. So last night I had ketogenic ice cream that's sold at the Aldi. Um, our local food store. Um, and I like to make my own sort of ketogenic desserts at home. And, uh, and we have a variety of baking powders. Uh, Yummy Foods is a, a company that makes powders for, uh, for breads, for uh, muffins, and for cookies. So we'll take that powder and just add eggs and a non-sugar-based sweetener and cook a variety of baking products that are typically off limits for a ketogenic diet. Uh, but I tend not to cheat. I, uh, on days, I will eat more of the same foods. Uh, sometimes during the week, I get very busy and I under eat and I might lose a little bit of weight. And on the weekends, I tend to just eat more because I have more time. And uh, but I'm trying to think of foods that I cheat with. Uh, if I go off the ketogenic diet, I like to do it with foods such as like popcorn or watermelon, or uh, I'll eat like more berries. Uh, occasionally I'll have sushi, uh, although maybe once a month, not even that, once every two months, I'll have sushi with rice. But they're like the three things that I can think of that I will, that are non-ketogenic foods and if I eat a lot of carbohydrates and I go back to the ketogenic diet the next day, typically by mid afternoon, I'm in a state of ketosis again because my body is so good at burning fat and creating ketones and I feel normal. And to tell you the truth, I think it's good uh, for most people to be metabolically flexible for their bodies to be adapted to eating low carbohydrates, but to occasionally eat carbohydrates so you can uh, acclimate and adjust the body to metabolizing, breaking down and using a wide variety of fuel, fuel sources. What is, not, what is not happening today in modern times is that uh, traditionally there would be limited food availability where we would go periods of time without eating and then we would naturally enter a state of ketosis, typically through fasting and sometimes carbohydrate restriction, right? But that's largely silenced today, and we never achieve that physiological state. So you could do that through intermittent fasting, and you can do that through periodic carbohydrate restriction that'll actually promote the state of ketosis. And once you promote it and maintain it for a certain period of time, you build your body's metabolic machinery. So the next time you do it, it's easier to transition into that state. And I think that's an important concept that's not really taught, but we know that that's the case. It's like if you go to the gym and work out to a certain level of strength and take some time off, you can get to that level of strength much faster. The same thing happens with metabolism. It, through epigenetic regulation, you're activating various pathways. You're upregulating various digestive, enzymatic systems, and even transporters like that actually transport ketones and fatty acids. And once you activate those systems, uh, those, those processes and those metabolic pathways are activated such that they become more robust when you enter that state again. And, and I think that's an important 
concept for people. And, be, you know, going back to my observation, the more I did the ketogenic diet, the easier it got and the more benefits I derived from it over time. And I think that's an important, and people can do it eating carbohydrates if they do intermittent fasting because it puts you into a fasting state. Wow, I'm gonna I'm gonna feel good the next time I'm having like a, a really bad cheat meal that I usually feel pretty bad about. But that that's really interesting because when I have like a very sugary drink as well, I tend to really bloat up because I don't do it that much. Is is that kind of you know leaping off of what you said? Yeah, so if we follow a strict ketogenic diet all the time and then we go back and have pizza or breads or pastries or uh, a lot of processed sugar, we will produce, overproduce insulin and we'll have a hard time metabolizing, digesting, and then storing all that sugar. So it's like if you have a factory, right, that's building one, like, uh, one type of, of equipment, whether it be tanks or, <laughs> or boats, and then you s transition the factory over to building cars, right? Uh, there's a transition period that is, is needed uh, to be able to effectively, uh, you know, put those parts into, into the machine. So athletes have a very robust capacity to be metabolically flexible. Uh, especially endurance athletes, because they often, there's something called post-exercise ketosis. They could be on a high carb diet, but they can train for so long that they deplete their carbohydrate stores to where they're primarily using fat as an energy source. And then they're producing ketones through prolonged exercise activity. So the body has already recognized uh, ketones as an energy metabolite. So uh, many of them can, can fast, many of them can you know, get into the state rather easily. But if you have someone who's eating carbohydrates at a very high percentage of their diet and they never go more than you know, half a day without eating, it's, it's going to be difficult for them to transition into a ketogenic diet, they should do it into stages, right? Restrict carbohydrates 20%, uh, you know, reduce it by 20, reduce it by 30. And then I think for even the normal person, maybe in India, if they could restrict their carbohydrates to no more than 100 grams per day, and for those carbohydrates to be more than 20% fiber, simply doing that will cause a profound change in their metabolism and, and also produce profound metabolic benefits. You know, it doesn't have to be an extreme ketogenic diet. And I think that's an important message because a ketogenic diet is really a medical therapy. It evolved to, to be that. Uh, and only a, a modest reduction in carbohydrates can make a pretty significant impact in a person's metabolic health. And I think that's an important mes message that needs to get across. It doesn't have to be a radical extreme diet to get, wow. to get uh, metabolic benefits. Th that's amazing. And do you personally fast for extended periods of times, like five days, seven days, um, you know, and, and if you do, what's kind of the schedule you go about with that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I do feel that, uh, a fasting protocol can be very beneficial for a person to implement. Uh, at most, for me personally, it would be once every quarter, and I think three to five days. Uh, and I'm coming up on that to where I think the, the end of this month, I was going to do uh, a fast. And how I calibrate it is that when I fast, if my ketone levels get higher than my glucose levels, <laughs> then we call that a glucose ketone index of one, right? If they're about the same level. So typically your ketones are zero and typically in millimolar concentrations, your glucose is about four or five, right? So if you fast after about 72 hours, your glucose will come down, uh, it depends on the person to about three as low as three. And then it takes about 72 hours for your ketones to come up to about three. And we would call that a glucose ketone index of one, 
but typically a normal person will have a glucose ketone index of like 25 or 30, which means in millimolar concentrations, you're 25 times higher than uh, the ketone levels, the glucose is. So if we fast and we achieve that GKI or glucose ketone index of one, and then we hold that physiological state for 24 hours, we will max out many of the beneficial signaling molecules that we associate with beneficial effects like autophagy or fatty acid oxidation. And it's also an indication that we have uh, achieved a level of caloric deficit that is producing a lot of benefits in the body, right? If it's, it, it can be done in a, in a healthy way. So for me, I can usually achieve that in three days. And for some people, it may take five days and some people it may take seven days. So what I like to do is to do uh, every quarter a 72 hour fast to achieve that glucose ketone index of one. And I know that it's stimulating things like autophagy. It's stimulating uh, a very high rate of fat oxidation in the liver and opening up a lot of those metabolic pathways. And paradoxically, but it may not be to you, but maybe to some of your listeners, I have a very high level of energy even on the third day of fasting. And I feel very lucid and very clear in my thinking. And uh, so it's something that I look forward to. It is depriving the body of food and the enjoyment of eating food, especially with my wife, because we like to enjoy dinner every night, but she's patient with me and acknowledges that I'm doing this because it's not only part of our research, but it's, it's something that I like to do. Um, so I, my personal schedule is to do a fast like four times a year but I think if someone did it twice a year or even once a year, I think they would see pretty significant benefits. Wow, and just a quick question. Do you work out during your training, uh, during your fast? Uh, I do. I will test my strength sometimes mm -hmm. at the end of the fast, but I view fasting as more of a, a meditative practice, uh, something to get me more centered uh, so what I typically, I will do a lot of journaling. I will, uh, uh, I may do uh, a meditative practice. I will do a lot of thinking and writing when it comes to work, uh, reflecting. So I, I choose a period of time where I don't have very high, uh, uh, extraordinarily high physical demands, but I do like to include light activity every day. So I'll do light work around the house, uh, walks in the sunshine with the dogs twice a day. That's something I do every day. So I'll continue on with that activity, but I won't do my heavy powerlifting movements as frequently, but I do like to test my strength at the end of a fast to just basically demonstrate that one can fast and still maintain sort of absolute strength. But what may be compromised is something called strength endurance. So if I can lift 500 pounds for a certain amount of reps, uh, when I'm fasting, I can typically do that and achieve that state, but I probably couldn't do 10 sets <laughs> of that. So what I've, what I've realized and other people that communicate with me is that your strength is not impaired much, but your strength endurance you know, uh, for certain types of exercise could be reduced. Uh, but it's remarkable how much strength and energy we can maintain and retain even with a prolonged fast. So that, that was really shocking to me the first time I did it about 10 years ago. Wow, you're lifting 500 pounds after a five day fast or a three day fast, that's incredible. Um, so I wanted to end with a few quick fire questions and one is that I've, I've been, I, I heard you mention on Tom Bilio's show that the idea of creative downtime, and this is not about diets, it, it can be per se, but can you talk about the idea of creative downtime and why it's so important to you? Yeah, well, I think especially nowadays where everything, the demands are very high, depending uh, pretty much every occupation, right? <laughs> the demands are, are going to be pretty high. Um, 
So we need to put our bodies into a state of restoration and to think and reflect, but also to balance not only our physiology and to reduce the sympathetic nervous system drive, but to balance ourselves in a way that we have a balance between the parasympathetic and, and sympathetic nervous system. Because if we're on hyperdrive all the time, that can have pretty deleterious effects on our physiology and in our psychology. So what we like to do is, uh, and it's part of why we live on a farm now, is to expose ourselves to natural sunlight, to nature, to animals, to the natural environment, to the smells, the air, um, and to do that every single day and to actually look at our, our calendar, our schedule, and actually put that time into our calendar as one of the most basic and important uh, scheduling events in our day. So this allows us taking time out to do that has allowed uh, me and my wife uh, allowed us to be more productive uh, because the, the time that we do spend you know, working is, uh, we feel recharged, we feel energetic, we're more creative. And then we get into to situations where we are reactive, but not creative. <laughs> so we're reacting to emails, we're reacting to the demands on our time. Uh, but if we don't carve out time, and it doesn't not, not have to be a nature walk or anything, it can be just sitting down with a journal, and I encourage journaling. It's something I did even when I was, uh, I think, 13 or 14. I started journaling, and I've always journaled. Uh, I think it's, it's really important to reflect and, and to have some kind of meditative practice. And to do that meditative practice and journal, or journal and do the meditative but to combine that when your physiology is in a state of relaxation and, and to do that at least, uh, I don't journal every day, but I do it you know, a couple times a week. Uh, but if you can do it every day, that's great. But nonetheless, I think it's really important to have nature and physical activity, uh, ideally to do that with someone that you love and you know, your partner uh, and it's time that you can spend together and to do that every day. You know, the, the biggest trend that I've seen on this show so far is that people who perform at high levels take time for themselves and have solitude or take time to spend with their loved ones and take this creative downtime that you're talking about. So I really find it awesome to, that you mentioned that, especially like you say, in our hyper overdrive life. And I want to move on to a similar question, which is how often do you use social media? Yeah, good question, because this comes up a lot. Uh, I use social media pretty much every day, uh, but I post every day. Like today, before I got on, I posted our newsletter. Uh, but what I don't do, and sometimes I feel guilty about it, and I know I shouldn't, is that I don't respond to people uh, responding to my social media posts. So, but I think that's generally a good thing to do. And I allocate uh, to 30 minutes on the weekends to do that and sometimes 30 minutes during the week. So a total amount of time, no more than one hour to respond to questions on my social media. So I do one hour per week, usually 30 minutes on the weekend and then 30 minutes. Uh, and then it probably takes me to post content and I like to post about, you know, experiments that I'm doing, you know, with a continuous glucose monitor using like the Levels Health System, or if I'm testing a different food product, that probably takes me uh, an hour per week. So no more than two hours per week do I spend kind of posting or answering questions. And I usually divide that and I actually schedule then. And then sometimes, it might be a little bit more than that, but not much more than that. Uh, that's amazing. And I think this has been a topic because the social dilemma has come out. So everybody's yeah. wondering about social media usage. I and watched that too. Yeah, you we did? watched that. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. It's incredible. It's yeah. incredible. The, the, you know, the, the only thing that I found funny about this, the social dilemma was that they didn't mention Netflix because Netflix is, is also a prime contributor to that. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'd like to add, you know, it is a double-edged sword and I think we can use it for good or we can use it as a time sink. Uh, but I know it has helped me make a lot of very meaningful connections uh, with people to help people with various disease processes and help link them to resources where they can get help. Um, but on the other hand, I see a lot of arguing on Twitter and just like, I, I basically avoid anything that's negative on social media and just try to stay uh, with, with things that are positive. And if I post something, I try to think about what kind of value does this post have? What kind of value does this information have? Is it helping people? And otherwise, I really feel like I shouldn't be posting it. And sometimes I have extended family members that kind of follow and sometimes I'll post some personal things if it's a picture at a beach or things like that, uh, just to inform them about what I'm doing. Or if I'm in a particular area of the world, maybe it will help me connect with people in that particular area. So we've, we've met some very interesting people traveling uh, in different countries and that has social media, I guess I can, social media has been a, a really big help, big help with that. And I, I think it's because you use it intentionally. And that's kind of what I want to transition to yeah. as well, using it with a purpose. Mm -hmm. And the last question, because I know we're running out of time is you can answer this quickly or you can, you can go um, however long as you'd like is by the end of your career, when you're looking back, what is the one thing that you would like to have solved or, or what do you want to achieve by the end of your career? Yeah, good question. Uh, I, you know, there's, there's a number of different, I want to contribute to the body of scientific information, uh, various, the, the science and the application of ways that people can empower themselves to uh, enhance metabolic optimization. So what's optimal for their personal physiology. So, uh, I mean, that's why I'm using a continuous glucose monitor now and it has been very eye-opening because, you know, certain people can eat the exact same diet and have different glycemic responses to that. And it's, it's much more than I predicted, you know, based upon my conventional training and knowledge on this topic. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm learning the interpersonal differences that people have in their own metabolism. And as I learn more about the subject, I want to research it and contribute to the science, but more importantly, move the science into meaningful human application and <laughs> methods and strategies that people can use to optimize their metabolism to not only feel better, but to promote a healthier and longer lifespan and happier, you know, uh, more protracted health span, I guess you could say. So going into to old age without the early onset of age-related diseases that are so common in the U.S. due to things like type 2 diabetes, uh, you know, obesity and things like that. So I, I think, uh, you know, there, there are people doing that, I have colleagues doing that, and they're making progress, but I think, and we're collaborating in a way that I think can make meaningful progress throughout my career path. And I'm about midway through my career. So I, I still have a lot to do <laughs> on that. Part. That's, that's amazing. Uh, Dr. Dominic, I want to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast. That was about the quickest hour of my life. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Did go fast. Well, thanks, Armand. Uh, you're a fantastic podcast host, as good at, or better than the best out there. So I appreciate you giving me the platform to talk about this on your show. And uh, yeah, be interested in coming back anytime you want to have me. Amazing. That'd be great. And if you ever visit India, please let me know. I'd love to show you around. Oh, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, we have not been there yet. We've been to a lot of places, uh, but have not been to India yet. So I will definitely reach out to you when we do. Amazing. And thank you to everybody for watching. See you guys in the next one. Just before you leave, uh, I know that was a podcast with a lot of technical terms and dense information. But if you're still interested in learning more about the ketogenic diet, I highly recommend that you go to Dr. Dominic's website, www.ketonutrition.org. And you can also follow him on Twitter at Dominic D'Agostino 2 or follow him on LinkedIn at Dominic D'Agostino. And I'll put all the social links in the description box below so that you guys can see it. 
And yeah, till the next time, see you.